thanks so much again um, for the opportunity. And uh, just a quick uh, caveat in the background, you may hear a couple of sounds. One of them is baby crying, the other is pager. I'm on inpatient service. So apologies if you hear either or both of those um, during the talk. But um, so this is a talk that I do um, primarily for our fellows and young faculty at Mayo. Um, and I actually do it for a couple different departments. Um, so really excited uh, to have the opportunity to do it here. Um, if we could start with the next slide. So I'll talk about what is this idea of graceful self-promotion and why it's important and also why it can be difficult for us as physicians, but also specifically as, as women physicians. And I'll spend the bulk of the time talking about strategies for how we can um, pursue graceful self-promotion. Next slide, please. So this idea um, of graceful self-promotion, so I think you guys all probably have a concept of what self-promotion might be. Um, and just in general, I think of it as emphasizing the best parts of yourself to others in a positive way. So your goal is to be seen positively by your target audience. But that may sound to you initially as kind of bragging or you know be seen in a negative light so i like to call it graceful self-promotion because that means doing this in an effective manner in your own professional context and that can mean many things but the way i think about it, of it is um taking into that account the culture of what you do where you work who your colleagues are who you're trying to promote yourself to and most importantly a way that feels comfortable to you so you don't feel like you're bragging or saying something that you don't truly mean. So being authentic, but also putting yourself out there to move forward in your career. Next slide, please. So why is this important? You know, I think a lot of us, myself included, often come into medicine with an idea of career development and career success as a meritocracy. It's what a lot of us have, you know, felt is the case during most of our career that the harder you work, the longer you study, the better grades that you get, the better you'll do. So we have this idea of a meritocracy that if you work hard and you have some underlying talent that you will be able to achieve success. But once you get out there in, in the real world, um, you can be a wonderful person, a very hard worker, but that doesn't always lead to career or personal advancement. So if no one knows about you, about what you're doing, about what your accomplishments are, they're not going to think of you. Um, they're not gonna think of you when looking for somebody to promote, for somebody to put into a leadership position. So you can't sit around just saying, hey, I worked really hard. That's absolutely the case, um, but not everyone is going to notice it and you're not going to get that promotion or that leadership position just by virtue of your hard work. So I, this is called tiara syndrome, uh, when you essentially are saying, hey, you know, I did the great work, you know, I deserve this promotion, and you expect somebody to put this tiara in your head and say, oh, look at Dr. X, they're so wonderful, let us make them the division head or the program director, any of these things. If you're not putting yourself out there, no one knows, no one's going to put that tiara on you. And what we want to do is prevent even the worst is somebody else does hard work but knows how to promote themselves and takes credit for something that you do or you could potentially do better. So we want to make sure that you're getting the recognition you deserve for that work that you put in. Next slide, please. So this is important for a number of reasons, but there actually is research, believe it or not, that shows this is helpful. So We've seen that those who self-promote have greater career satisfaction than those who don't. But if you look externally, there was actually a survey study of deans of US medical schools, and they stated that the most common characteristic that distinguished their rock star faculty was self-promotion. So you can see here, 47% of deans consider that this was an important characteristic in distinguishing their rock star faculty. Um, the next down was hardworking at 44%, but it's really interesting to me that self-promoting actually came out ahead of hardworking um, as something that distinguishes somebody as a rock star. Um, and on the other side of things, 
Um, there are studies that people who don't self-promote because you're shy or because you're afraid to come off as overly boastful, actually that's not doing yourself any favor. So people tend to feel less close to somebody who hides their success rather than shares it. They actually may feel insulted if you don't share that success because they want to be a part of it. They want to feel like they're walking that path with you and can give you the recognition that you deserve. But if you're not sharing it, they feel, hey, you know, this person must not be that close to me to feel that they can share their successes. Um, they may infer that, you know, maybe you have a maternalistic motive, like you're afraid it's going to make them feel bad about themselves if you share your success. Whereas it actually makes them more wanting to talk about their own successes as well as everybody's kind of sharing what they're doing um, and how they've gotten there. Next slide, please. This is also very difficult for us as physicians. So we don't wanna come across as arrogant. We don't wanna be seen as aggressive. We don't wanna turn people off. And for many of us who went through training, um, it's a very hierarchical system. So we assume that as we move through the system, as we go from resident to fellow, to attending, to you know, leadership positions, that we will naturally get that credit and praise, and that maybe if we're earlier on in our career, we don't deserve it. Um, and this can be specifically um, difficult for women um, and those from specific cultures. So I'll give a couple of examples, just you know, with a caveat that these are gross generalizations based on population and sociologic studies. It's not saying all women do X, Y, or Z, or all people from a cultural background X do Y, but just you know, a couple of examples. Um, next slide, please. So there's this idea of independent versus interdependent cultures. So interdependent cultures are traditionally those encompass women, um, as well as those from specific areas of the world, and also those from lower um, socioeconomic status. And the focus has traditionally been relationships with others. So you connect with others, you look for harmonization in relationships. That's what a lot of us, you know, as women, I think naturally want to do. And we're concerned about the effects of our actions on others. And you can see where this is going, that that may go directly against wanting to promote ourselves. You do the independent culture is more traditional kind of in the Western areas, as well as those who are white and from upper socioeconomic status. And the focus here has been more on individualism, uniqueness and self confidence. And again, you can see where this is going. These are the people who may naturally self-promote better than others. Um, next slide, please. So a word specifically on women. So we know that there are a lot of challenges for women um, in any profession, but specifically for women in, me uh, in medicine. There's implicit bias and microaggressions. There's unfortunately explicit bias. Um, and there's a lot of societal messages, the way we've been brought up and trained, and a lot of internal messages that prevent self-promotion. Um, women are afraid because they feel like they may be imposters, that they may not deserve the recognition for the work that they've done. Um, there are traditional gender norms. So there's one um, sociologic mechanism, it's called the backlash avoidant model. So it says that women insufficiently self-promote because they fear for a backlash. So if you're seen as boastful or bragging, that's a traditionally male characteristic. Um, and so women fear that if they are perceived as doing something outside the traditional gender role, that there will be a negative backlash. Um, women tend to focus more on our perceived weaknesses. And I think many people have probably heard the statistic that if you're looking at a job description, women often don't apply for job unless they feel they're 100% qualified for all of the recommended um, characteristics and qualifications for that job, whereas men are much more likely to say, hey, I'm just going to go for it, even though I don't meet all those characteristics. But, you know, I'm good enough. I might as well give it a try. Uh, next slide, please. So I want to focus the rest on strategies for graceful self-promotion. So the first thing is to kind of internally reset our view of what this means. It's not something that's egotistical or selfish, and it's certainly not something if done right that's unprofessional. What you're actually doing is educating others about yourself. You're not selling yourself. So you're not this used car salesman kind of sketchy figure on the left here. You're actually 
educating others about who you are, what you do, what your strengths are. And ultimately it's your own responsibility for moving ahead in your career, just like it's your responsibility for following up on a patient's lab that you've ordered or giving that patient a call back, just like it's your responsibility for getting a grant that, you know, done that you said you would. Uh, this is part of your career development and it's your responsibility to learn how to do it. Next slide, please. So a couple of things that I suggest, um, certainly networking and collaboration. Um, there has have been a lot of changes due to the COVID era. We're certainly not going to as many in-person meetings, um, but there actually, I think, there may be more opportunities virtually, right? Like if you guys had asked me to do a talk before COVID, it might have involved coming to San Antonio, and that probably wouldn't have been possible on a weekday when I'm on inpatient service. Um, but doing a talk now absolutely is. So there are a lot more opportunities out there to network virtually. Um, so what do you want is an elevator pitch. So if somebody asks, who are you? Tell me a little bit about yourself. You want a two to three sentence description of what your interest is, what your background is, and what you hope to do in your career. And then kind of in the background, I like to have in my mind a power map. So people that you're interacting with on a regular basis um, that can have an impact on your career. So both those who have power over you. So that may be if you're a trainee, kind of your program leadership. If you're an early career, it may be your division chair or your department chair or the research chair of your department. Um, and also you wanna identify those that you can work with. You wanna network of people that are your peers and colleagues that can encourage each other, cheer each other on, say, hey, you did a really good job of X, Y, or Z, or hey, you know, you got this great award or accomplishment, why aren't you doing a better job of, of bringing it to other people's attention? So you wanna have this, this network of people that can help one another to help uh, Next slide, please. Um, networking can be tough. Um, and I used to picture it as, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to go to this big reception of 200 people and introduce myself to people that I've never met before. How am I possibly, you know, going to find somebody to connect with? So I actually like to look at meeting agendas ahead of time and say, hey, here's two or three people that I might really want to meet um, that could be helpful to my career. Maybe able to give me some good advice um, and reach out to them instead of hoping to just randomly run into them at this conference. Um, knowing their work, so almost like you're going to an interview where you would look up the background of the person that you're interviewing. So knowing who they are and what they do, um, talking with them, maybe asking for some advice, following up by saying, hey, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me. You know, I loved discussing mentorship with you. Here's a copy of my CV. If you would be interested in mentoring me in the future, you know, I'd really love, love to keep in touch with you. Um, joining committees, both locally within your institution and nationally is a great way to network, meet people who have similar interests and be kind of in the line for leadership positions in the future. And one I found really helpful recently has been um, listserv social media. So kind of Twitter chats, Clubhouse is starting to be a bigger thing for medicine specifically. Um, there are some Facebook and common interest groups. I'm in a women in key monk interest group. So those have actually been not only a great opportunity for networking clinically, but also a great opportunity for collaboration. Um, I actually um, connected with a couple of women um, at two different other institutions and we wrote a position paper together that got published in academic medicine. And I've Never, I had never at the time that we wrote that paper met them in person. It was all online. Um, so I think there's some great opportunities out there. Next slide, please. Um, so a couple other things to keep um, in mind. So nonverbal cues. So taking a seat at the table. There's a lot of times I think as junior faculty that you get to a meeting and there's maybe only one or two seats left at the main table and you decide to sit in the back instead. Really hard to get noticed that way. Um, leaning in keeping engaged, putting your hands on the table, making eye contact, smiling sometimes, you know, there, there's a tough balance because women are often, and it irritates me to know, and child, you should really smile more. And nobody is telling men that for the most part. Um, so yes, smile, but don't view it as something that you have to permanently have a smile stuck on your face. Um, speaking with confidence, speaking clearly and concisely. And a big one that I hear a lot um, is self-minimization. 
I want you guys to all go back and look at the last couple of emails you wrote or tape yourself when you're talking and look for the word just. It's something that all of us do um, for the most part and none of us realize how much we do it. I just wanted to check in on the status of, you know, I'm just looking to see if we could meet. That word just really minimizes yourself. It doesn't need to be there. It serves no positive purpose in the conversation and it only makes you seem like you're not as confident. So try to take that just out of your vocabulary. And also things like, this isn't my area of expertise. That may absolutely be the case, but you don't need to broadcast that out there. You can simply say, I'd like to learn more about this. So I think just taking really a look at, you know, how you speak, how you present yourself, looking at the last couple of emails you've written and try to minimize those behaviors that are kind of not, uh, not necessary. They're maybe taking away from your positive qualities um, is really helpful. Next slide. Um, based on that discussion of the interdependent versus the independent cultures, you know, again, the classic model is that women are more in, uh, interdependent and looking to form those connections and more worried about what other people think. So keeping in mind that speaking up doesn't mean you're selfish. You want to come to the table assuming your input is as good as the rest of the people around the table. Not to say that it's better, but it's as good. You are good enough to be there. You don't need to have this imposter syndrome that mm, everybody else is smarter than me or does better than me. Um, and then looking for mentors who actually have a different personality type can be very helpful. So you can ask them to specifically call you out on these types of behaviors um, and say, you know, when you were in that meeting, we're really pulling back or you really minimized yourself in the way that you were speaking. Um, for those who tend to be more interdependent at baseline and may come across as a little bit forceful, um, recognizing that you do need to adjust to others. The idea of self-promotion is not to go out there and say, I'm fantastic, you know, you need to give me this promotion because I deserve it. We don't want to come across like that. That's where the graceful comes in. Um, so it's, it's that balance of, you know, getting yourself out there, but also adjusting to others' expectations and the culture of your workplace. And then recognizing the value of relationships and not just the result. You know, did you get the promotion? Well, maybe you didn't, but you met five people along the way who you could have networked with in the future. Um, next slide. And then promoting outward. So I talked a little bit about finding a network of colleagues. Um, it's helpful to have some early career colleagues so you can kind of talk about the issues that you're all facing together, but also colleagues who are a little bit further on who are kind of mid or later career um, and promoting each other to leadership. So I find myself doing this quite commonly now. If one of my peers gets a grant or an award, and is afraid to say anything about it, I will actually email our division chair or our research chair and say, hey, did you hear about you know, this award that uh, Dr. X got? And then an email gets sent out to the entire division. So when people are afraid to do this for themselves, it's helpful to have a network so you can do it for each other. And the same thing with awards, you know, whether it's internal or national, nominating each other within your network can be very helpful. Um, next slide. So promoting upwards, something that we often forget about because of that traditional hierarchy of medicine. But if your chair has been particularly helpful um, in your career development, or if your program director has been particularly helpful in your career development, actually sending a thank you email saying, I really appreciate your time and your work. Um, this has been really instrumental in my career development, and I, I wanted to thank you for that. That will give them this sense of accomplishment and say, hey, this is a, a really great person and I'm very thankful that I helped them out. Um, and certainly promoting downwards people who are earlier on in their career than you, whether that be medical students, residence fellows, um, you're gonna be a better role model and a mentor and a sponsor if you promote them and help them move their careers forward. And not that this is the reason that you should be doing it, but in the future when you're going up for promotion or when you're going up for an award, these are people who, if you've helped them out, will really want to help you out. Um, next slide. Aligning yourself with your leadership and institutional goals is very important. 
So you don't want to be out there saying, hey, I'm going to apply for a grant in X, Y, or Z. Will this division support me? You want to say, our division's priority is X, Y, or Z. And I know that and I want to align myself with it. So I'd like to apply for this grant to be able to further our mission. Um, if you have success sharing it within your local groups, within your national groups, and on social media, you know, again, this is not bragging. This is saying, hey, I'm proud of what I did. You know, I published this article. I'm going to tweet it out. Uh, I'm going to share it with other people so they know who I am and what I'm about and what I'm doing. It's not bragging. It's sharing your accomplishments and people are going to be happy for you. Um, next slide. Again, please don't minimize yourself. If somebody says congratulations on getting that grant, oh, it was really just a small institutional grant. It was really all luck. Somebody had already started the project. The groundwork was already laid. All of that may be the case. You may be lucky, you may have gone into a project that somebody laid the groundwork for, but what is the purpose of saying something like that? Somebody's trying to do something nice by giving you a compliment and saying congratulations on your grant or award. So please take the compliment and say, thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm very happy that I got this award. It doesn't need to be um, this feeling that somebody who's saying congratulations um, is going to feel bad if you say, thank you. You know, they, that, that's not what they're trying to do. They're not trying to make anybody feel bad. They're simply trying to congratulate you. Um, next slide. And then, yes, I, I think there is a balance between kind of authenticity and looking to improve. When I talk to our fellows, I have a number of our shyer fellows come up to me and say after the talk, you know, I don't use Twitter. I'm not on social media. I'm not comfortable doing that. I'm in no way saying that you have to change your personality to be somebody that you're not. I want everybody to continue to be comfortable in your personal style. If you absolutely don't feel comfortable sitting at the big table at a meeting, that's okay. Um, you don't have to go sit at the head of the table. Um, there are small things that you can do. Try to get that just out of your vocabulary. Try to promote your colleagues. There are small steps that you can take um, by knowing your own personality, by asking your colleagues and mentors to give feedback on your style and be willing to make small adjustments, not radical changes based on that feedback. And, and the phrase that I really like, um, I'm actually very much an introvert, but in certain situations um, when it is helpful um, for myself or for my colleagues, I can be a situational extrovert. So I like this concept of you know, yes, you don't have to change from an introvert to an extrovert. You don't have to change who you are and what you stand for, but making small adjustments that are helpful over time is the goal. Next slide, please. So that is pretty much it. I've included a few resources here. Um, I really like these. Uh, I started listening to a lot more podcasts recently. So um, the HBR Women at Work um, and HBR Ideacast are very, very helpful. Um, they are not focused on medicine, and sometimes I find that's actually more helpful. They're focused on just women who are working and trying to do the best they can um, in their career development, and there are universal themes here um, that I think are really helpful. So with that, um, I think that was my last slide. Thank you.